to talk about um, what I'm calling the hidden power of companies to change the game on climate. You heard from Hal and John, and I would agree with what they said about what, what's needed. It's a whole bunch of things. I'll get more into that. Um, I do have what may be a somewhat unusual perspective. So I'm going to start with a little background on me. Priya just gave some of it, so I'll rush through this. Um, so as she said, I started my career as a professor in computer science at MIT. I moved out west in the mid 90s. I worked at Digital in their research labs on computer hardware and software. Then I moved to Akamai where I was chief architect and then CTO where I began to learn a lot about the business side, not just the technology side of things. And then about 15 years ago, I started to freak out about climate. And this was me all too often at 3 a.m. in the morning when I couldn't sleep. I wasn't worrying about or stewing about, you know, some hard technical problem or people, people problem at work, or occasionally it was kids who couldn't sleep or whatever. But um, this was me thinking about climate change and what it meant for my future and my kids' future and everyone's future. And I was putting solar in my house. I bought a Prius, which was the pinnacle of clean cars back then. But it was clear that much more needed to happen than I could do as an individual in my own life. Um, and that I, I decided to change careers to see if I could find a way to contribute, not just in my personal life, but professionally on climate. I was lucky enough in 2006 to land a job at Google with the charter to figure out what they were going to do on climate, which was an incredible opportunity. They took a big risk on me and, and vice versa. And I led climate and clean energy work at Google for about six years. And then I moved to Facebook in a similar role for about six years. And I had the good fortune at both companies to dip my toes into a number of the things that are needed to solve the climate crisis, including research and development, venture investing to fund early stage clean tech startups, project finance, where over time, Google, starting when I was there, but much more since, has, they provided billions of dollars in debt and equity to finance clean energy projects, using our purchasing power to move markets, and then collaborating through industry groups like the Renewable Energy Buyers Alliance, RE100, and others to use our collective purchasing power to move markets at a much, much bigger scale. And I'm really proud of what I achieved at Google and Facebook and of what the sustainability teams at those companies and many others I've worked with continue to do. And yet, I'm still freaking out about climate. Three years ago, I was coming to a difficult realization that for all the great things that companies like Google and Facebook and many others, not just tech companies are doing, we're not moving fast enough on climate. I mean, I knew that, but you know, three years ago, I was thinking about what, you know, what do I do next? What does Facebook do next? What should I do next? It was really beginning to hit home. And this year it's even more real. This is a picture my wife took about a month ago in San Francisco, that's where, where I live. This is what the skies look like in the middle of the day in early September because of smoke from the wildfires we've had out here. And we're in the midst of an unprecedented wildfire season in the Western US, an unprecedented hurricane season along the East Coast and the Gulf Coast. We've seen many other natural disasters around the world in part fueled by climate change. And it's only going to get worse as, as temperatures rise. So like many of you, my roots are in technology. I started working in technology. I switched at Google and Facebook to facilitating and, and, and scaling technological solutions to climate change. And we do need new technology to solve this problem. And John Doerr made this point. We don't have all the solutions we need. He said he thinks we've got the technologies today to get about 70 or 80% of the way there. I don't know what the exact number is there. I think 70 to 80% is probably a, a good guess. Um, we are not deploying that technology fast enough. And we do need new technology to solve some hard to decarbonize sectors and to make the ones we do know how to decarbonize, make that easier, cheaper, faster, and so on. And we do need companies to step up and lead voluntarily as Google, Facebook, hundreds of others now have been doing. But what I began to understand several years ago as I stepped back and thought about where I wanted to go and where Facebook needed to go and where the world needed to go, I, I really understood that technological innovation and companies leading voluntarily and kind of natural market forces, it wasn't enough. We were winning, we are winning, but we're winning too slowly. And with climate, winning slowly is the same as losing. The IPCC 1.5 degree report from two years ago lays out the likely consequences of warming of two, three or four degrees C. And it's probably pretty horrific. 
we know there are tipping points, though we don't know precisely where they are, which makes the risk of kind of not doing, not working faster, um, the uncertainty is high. And we know we have a carbon budget, which we are rapidly blowing through as we kind of hope for some solution in the future that will just suck all that carbon back out. We need to move quickly on climate, really quickly, as Hal and John said, we need to cut emissions in half by 2030 and to net zero by 2050. And I really like to focus on that 2030 number because 2050 is vital, but if we don't cut emissions in half or very close to it by 2030, we're in deep, deep trouble. And that's what we should be focused on, which means we need to be moving now. So we can create a much cleaner, brighter future, but it's going to take some work. And as John said, and I've heard Hal Harvey say this many times, it's all about speed and scale. It's about moving fast and doing it at enormous scale. Companies can play a key role, not just tech companies to be clear, that's the sector I've been in for my whole life, but companies in all sectors and especially big companies, but they need to do more than they have been doing and all of us need to help them do it. So this, the, coming to this realization is why in 2018, I decided to leave Facebook and earlier this year, I founded a nonprofit Climate Voice to encourage companies to step up to the leadership we need from them in the coming decade not just what they've been doing for the last decade, not just what they, they're willing to do and find relatively easy, but what we need them to do. And I said, it's not just technology, it's not just companies voluntarily cleaning up their own operations. We need much more than that to solve the climate crisis. So I like to think of it as kind of like improv, it's yes and. So we need basic science, we need tech innovation, we need finance, Lots of money is going to have to move. What we wanted to do, and we've seen that this year with, with the various recovery or stimulus or, or whatever you want to call the, the, the government uh, uh, expenditures, um, vast amounts of money, but we need to spend it in a way that actually drives the solutions we need, not just builds more of the stuff we've been doing. These are all needed to get the massive deployment that we need to get clean energy everywhere to get clean transportation, clean buildings to clean up industry and so on. And we need behavior change and voluntary action by individuals and probably culture change too, to make some of this happen. When most people think about what companies can do to help with climate change, it's these kinds of things. Innovating, cleaning up their own operations, using their market power as major purchasers to drive scale and drive down costs, investing in R&D, in startups, in huge clean energy projects. That's most of what I and my colleagues did at Google and Facebook and what people have been doing at hundreds of other companies that are beginning to really act on climate. But that alone isn't enough. To move at the speed and scale required, as Hal said, we need public policy. Smart policy can underpin and tur turbocharge all these other things. It can reduce risk. It can drive much faster investment, innovation, and deployment. And one really important point that I think a lot of people, certainly in the, the research world, don't understand, I didn't until you know, maybe a few years ago, deployment drives cost reduction because deployment enables innovation, not of the kind that happens in a lab necessarily, but the kind that happens as you learn by doing and as you have the money to invest in, in improving processes. And that is a big part of what has driven the massive reduction in costs in wind and solar in the last number of years, even in batteries, which aren't cheap enough, but they have come down an enormous amount. But sadly, emissions are still rising, maybe not this year with the pandemic, but the overall trend is nowhere close to where it needs to be. And even in the places where emissions are beginning to drop, they're not dropping fast enough. As John Doerr said, emissions need to drop on the order of eight to 10% a year for the next decade, and then continue that after that. And the reason emissions aren't dropping as fast as they need to is largely because we don't have strong enough policies in place. Innovation is happening, maybe not at the pace we need it to. Deployment is happening, definitely not at the pace we need it to. Behavior change is happening, nowhere near fast enough. And honestly, I think, you know, people, I don't believe people will just change their behavior and that'll solve this problem. We need everything. And this is absolutely true in the US. Uh, we don't have strong enough policies in place. It's also true in almost all other countries. 
We are seeing encouraging signs in some countries and in the EU with the European Green Deal. I think that's incredibly encouraging and in some states in the US, but we need to move much faster everywhere. So why don't we have the public policies we need? And this is really where I wanna focus because I think Hal Harvey is absolutely right. I think Hal and John are both right, but we need public policy. The question is why don't we? And here, it's a little uncomfortable maybe to talk about this. It begins to sound political, but public policy is about power and influence. And the dominant business voice on climate and energy policy today comes from the fossil fuel industry. And by and large, certainly for the last 40 years, they have been fans of going slowly or not at all on climate action. They've promulgated lots of misinformation to try to confuse things and make it harder to pass real climate policies. They wanna preserve the status quo. This is beginning to change with a few of the fossil fuel companies, but most of them are still working pretty hard to preserve the status quo. And they are really powerful and have been incredibly successful at stymieing progress on climate now for decades. To make this a little clearer, studies have shown that the fossil fuel industry in the last, well, from 2000 to 2016, outspent pro-climate advocates by a factor of 10 in the US. And we're not talking small amounts of money. According to the studies, the fossil fuel industry in that time period spent about 2 billion, that's billion with a B, lobbying on climate. Almost all of that to stop or weaken or delay useful climate policies. And there are many forms of influence in politics. It's not just about money spent on lobbying. There are campaign contributions. There are other ways of currying favor with politicians and making it clear to them that they should vote the way you want because otherwise you can maybe get them booted out of their seat. But we've got the fossil fuel interests outspending pro-climate advocates 10 to one and doing lots of other things to influence the conversation while most other companies are sitting on the side. So imagine instead a time in the near future where the influence of the fossil fuel companies is balanced by other powerful forces, where this is a fair fight, where that lonely pawn is not just a few environmental groups, actually lots of environmental groups, and millions of young people around the world and, and not so young people fighting for this and people voting, but it's not enough to counter what the fossil fuel companies are doing. Who could actually get off the sidelines and make this a fair fight? Um, most companies aren't invested in the fossil fuel economy, and many of them are innovating on climate solutions. Many of them are cleaning up their own operations and their supply chains. They've been leading on climate, and that includes tech, healthcare, hospitality, biotech, consumer goods, many other sectors. They all have influence, but most choose not to use it or to use it very rarely. And we need them to get off the sidelines in this chess game and help counter the powerful forces that are dragging us in the wrong direction. That means being strong, consistent advocates for policies that ensure we decarbonize rapidly across the entire economy. More broadly, it means being all in on climate in everything they do across their operations, their supply chain, their products, and especially their advocacy for public policy. They should be asking for everything they do, not just what's the impact on the financial bottom line, but what's the impact on our collective climate bottom line? They're not asking that question today. The fossil fuel companies, to be clear, all in, have been all in now for decades, mostly on the wrong side of the climate issue. Though, as I said, we have seen some positive signs from some of them, including BP and Shell. You might be wondering why all these other companies that have been good on climate, they've been leading, why they aren't speaking up in favor of bold action on climate. And the short answer is they're afraid. They see risk. And honestly, the risk is real. Climate has been so politicized, I think very intentionally, especially in the US, there is real risk of political backlash if a company takes a strong stand on climate policies. And over the last few decades, as a result, many companies have decided they should be apolitical unless a policy issue directly affects them. Actually, not just on climate, but on many issues, companies have decided politics is not for them unless they really need to be in there. So they stay silent and they like to think of that as neutrality. They say they should stay out of climate politics because they're not an energy company or a transportation company or a construction company. So most climate policies don't affect them directly in the near term. 
And they say that they want them to focus on where they can do the most good to use their superpower in their operations, their products, their supply chain. We absolutely want them to use their superpowers, but it's not enough. And I think that's been clear from the last 10 or 20 years as companies have been using their superpowers, emissions has still been rolling up. Given the extreme imbalance of power in the climate policy debates, their silence is really complicity with the powerful forces working desperately to maintain the status quo. Companies, especially big companies, have a lot of influence. We need them to use it for the collective good, not just for their own benefit. This is their hidden power. They have influence. We need them to take it out of hiding. They all have it. They choose mostly not to use it. We need them to step up and use it for our collective future. So you might be thinking, gee, could this work? You know, how do we make companies do this? We have seen situations before in, in, in the US and I think in other places, but I'm most familiar with what's happened in the US where companies were motivated to speak up on public policy, even when it didn't directly affect their own operations and their bottom line. And one recent and really inspiring example comes from the LGBT rights movement. A decade ago, there were hundreds of companies with progressive internal policies promoting equality for LGBT employees. But the companies were mostly silent in debates on public policy around that in the US. That changed and changed over two or three years and it changed in large part because employees and students sent a very clear signal to companies that it was time for them to speak up. So what did employees do? They organized internally, they spoke out in all hands meetings with executives on internal message boards, in direct conversations with executives. They coordinated with outside groups. The outside groups threatened to make a public stink about the companies being complicit through their silence if they didn't start to speak up. And the result was amazing. Companies spoke up on marriage equality at the state and then federal level. They spoke up on the Religious Freedom Restoration Act in Indiana and got it repealed. They spoke up on the bathroom bill in North Carolina and got it repealed and many other state policies, other religious freedom acts, other bathroom bills in other states, and they helped change the outcomes. And they spoke up because for them, LGBT rights went from being an issue that didn't matter to the bottom line to one that did because continuing to be silent could affect recruiting and retention. The result was companies went from being bystanders, we don't discriminate, to what in anti-bullying literature people call upstanders. We advocate for equality and against discrimination everywhere. We actively intervene to change the system, not just being good people ourselves. And we've seen a similar dynamic this year as companies have moved from being not racist to trying to figure out how to be actively anti-racist in the face of massive protests against racial equality and oppression. So this is why we started Climate Voice earlier this year. Companies care about their key stakeholders, their customers, their investors, and especially their employees. We're mobilizing the workforce to commit, convince companies that now is the time to speak up because workers have influence. And when we speak up, especially together, we have power. We need companies to make the same transition on climate from we don't pollute to being actively anti-pollution that they've made on other issues and to be strong, consistent advocates for public policy on climate everywhere they operate. Together, we can make that happen. It's beginning to work. Earlier this spring in Virginia, the Virginia Clean Economy Act was signed into law. Clean energy companies supported it, no surprise there, but so did many companies not in the energy sector, some of them listed here, where this law had little or no impact on their own operations and bottom line. It's part of a state level trend to move aggressively toward meeting carbon reduction goals. In the US, this is the first Southern state with a law like this. And it was our first policy victory. It's one example of quite a few where we're starting to see more companies getting off the sidelines and speaking up in favor of climate policy. And it's making a real difference. I believe this can be a game changer. This can be one thing that can really start to tip the balance in getting the kinds of policies we need to drive things at the speed and scale that are needed. So one really important point, you might be thinking, well, I live in Virginia or I live in Paris or I live wherever, why do I care about policy halfway around the world? It's not just people in Virginia who should be raising their voice about a bill in Virginia or in Paris about policies in France or the EU. We need climate action and climate policy everywhere.
It's not gonna be the same everywhere, but we need it everywhere. Climate Voice can give your voice power everywhere because let's say I worked at Google, if you're a Google employee anywhere in the world, you can motivate Google to speak up in North Carolina or anywhere else they operate. Similarly, if you're a student anywhere and Google's interested in hiring you, you can motivate Google to speak up anywhere they operate. So regardless of where you are, if a company you work for or are interested in working for is too quiet on policies, anywhere it operates, you can help change that. The key is to do this in large enough numbers. They don't have to be huge, but they have to be large enough for the companies to notice and care. So we are working to educate the workforce, current and future employees, about the need for companies to get off the sidelines, about the role they, including you, can play in making that happen. And we're working with groups like Influence Map in the UK, which is scoring companies on how they use their influence on climate to ensure that employees and students have information about which companies are speaking up and which are silent. And then we're giving them tools to raise their voices together. So just to wrap up, what can you do? First thing is talk about it. You have more influence than you might think. And there are almost certainly people around you who feel the same way. Together, you can change things. So talk to colleagues, talk to your box, boss, talk to other executives where you work. If you're a student, talk to other students and make clear at job fairs and in job interviews that this is an issue that matters to you. Don't be silent. Just like we don't want the companies to be silent, we all need to get off the sidelines or the fossil fuel companies will continue to dominate the conversation. Don't accept that the situation is broken and we can't change it. The business as usual path is pretty bleak. We can choose a much brighter future, but we have to choose it and enlist others to join in making it happen. Second, ask questions of your employer or potential employers about what they're doing on climate in their operations, their supply chain, their products, and especially in using their influence on public policy. And here, it can get uncomfortable. You need to be persistent. Don't be surprised, especially if you're talking to a company that's been leading on climate, if the initial response feels a bit like a brush off. Hey, we, we're leading, we're doing all this stuff. We've spoken out on these three things. Um, we're great. I would say they're good. We need them to be great. Be polite, keep asking, push on what they need to do, not just what they've done, which may be really good, but it's not enough. Encourage your fellow employees and students to do the same. Third, organize with fellow employees to encourage your company lobby for climate. Earlier this year, we saw over 150 companies sign a joint letter to the European Commission, encouraging them to invest recovery money in building the foundation for a low carbon economy, not just to rebuild what we had before. And we're seeing signs of hope in the US with over 30 companies sending a similar letter to the US Congress this summer. And so, as I said, some companies have been speaking up on state level policies that can really move the needle like the one in Virginia. Now is really the time, if we're gonna cut emissions in half in the next decade, we've gotta get policies in place in the next one to two years to really move the needle especially in the US where I think 2021 will be an absolutely critical year for policy change on climate, regardless of the outcome of, of the election in November. We need to bend the curve on climate quickly and we need much more aggressive public policy to make that happen. Fourth, and this is a little more effort, take the time to get educated about the climate policies being debated both where you live and in other places where your company or a company you're interested in operates and push your company to support the decent policies. We don't want companies say, oh, we use electricity, we'll be involved in electricity policy, but we're not a transportation company, so we don't, we're not gonna get engaged there. They need to get involved in climate policy, all of the different sectors and all the different kinds of policies. And it's important that the companies and you, should, you shouldn't be overly ideological about what policies to support. Climate is complex, politics is messy. We need decent policies not perfect ones. A decent policy that drives progress and that can be improved later is far, far better than no policy at all, which is not exactly where we are, but we're moving far too slowly. We have way too little. Um, you can learn more about the kinds of policies companies should be supporting in our policy guide for business leaders. If you go to climatevoice.org and click on resources, scroll down, you'll find it. It's a short read, about eight pages, including the table of contents. So great for the beach or wherever else you like to read, you can get through it, I think, pretty quickly.
And then finally, this is the big call to action, add your voice to thousands of others, calling on companies, helping to raise the bar for companies to get them to unlock their hidden power to change the game on climate.